So, hello everyone. We are very happy to have Ahmed today with us. He is a PhD student at UCSD uh, and he has been uh, working on a variety of uh, very interesting problems uh, at the interface of uh, more uh, conventional ideas in motion planning and at the same time uh, how this interfaces with modern machine learning methods. Uh, he's advised by uh, Mike Yip. He uh, works in a lab that works on autonomous robotic surgery uh, and ideas of how to in, in build both hardware and software um, sort of innovations uh, to enable autonomy in surgery. Uh, a lot of the work that uh, Ahmed has done has got a lot of attention actually uh, from uh, both robotics and, uh, and machine learning community. Uh, and Ahmed has been uh, also very, very productive, I would argue, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of his sort of publication output. Uh, and uh, today he's going to talk to us about a particular line of work in motion planning networks. Uh, I believe this is a couple of papers already uh, that you have been working on. Uh, and in general, uh, you should check out some of uh, some of his sort of like latest papers uh, that uh, he has been working on. One particular paper that I really liked was also neural manipulation planning with constraint methods or on constraint manifolds. Uh, so yeah, uh, all to you, uh, Emmet, and uh, hopefully we'll have interesting questions afterwards. Thank you, Animish, uh, for the introduction and for having me here. So let's get started uh, and have a deep dive into motion planning networks or short name MPNet. But before I get there, let me give a brief background on motion planning, its application, and what are the existing solutions and what are their limitations and that what motivated us to have new class of algorithms called like neural motion planners. So the problem of motion planning is to find a path solution connecting the given start and goal states while satisfying all the desired constraints. Now, Depending on the task, there could be different type of constraints. For example, Boolean avoidance, dynamical constraint on robot acceleration or velocity, or kinematic constraints on robot stability or end effector orientations. And we look into class of algorithm that strictly satisfy the given constraints, not satisfy them through relaxation, because if you relax them, this kind of humanoid motion can happen and you won't like that. So you should completely satisfy them and guarantee that your motion is executable on the system. <clears throat> now, this problem of motion planning was formulated in late 1970s and since then, various kinds of algorithms have been proposed from resolution complete methods such as artificial potential fields and eventually to sampling based planners uh, these are probabilistically complete. They start from some root state and expand our tree by randomly sampling obstacle free spaces. And eventually the tree will find a goal region and one branch of the tree will be your path solution. And the notable algorithms in this uh, area are like RRT, it's variant RRT star and then bidirectional version of these algorithms. However, even the sampling based method, despite being uh, adopted as standard tool, they still have high computational complexity when you uh, uh, expand them to realistic problems. The reason is that these algorithms ex have to explore the entire space. And imagine when you are planning in higher dimensional spaces where your region is extremely vast and you have to explore that until you find a path solution. And this is in contrast to biological perspective because these algorithms perceive the environment, perform an exhaustive search, and then start moving. Whereas in biological planning, we perceive and right away we start moving by utilizing our past experiences. And that's why we are able to get to our targets like much more quickly than these algorithms. So inspired from the biological planning perspective, we proposed a new class of algorithms that address the limitation of existing methods. The new class we named neural motion planning and 
we proposed motion planning networks in uh, in that uh, new area of research that I would say. And many people think of MPNet as just a couple of neural networks. It's not just that. It is a recursive planning algorithm that uses neural network to decompose problem into a sequence of sub problems and find their solution sequentially until you have end to end motion trajectory. Now within MPNet, there are like neural modules. One is encoder network, which takes the environment perception. It could be raw point cloud data and embeds them into a feature space, which we can label Z. And this, uh, feature space is taken by a neural planner which has some stochastic neural module in it to incrementally find a, a path solution. Now the encoder network could be anything. It could be 3D CNN, point net or feed forward neural network, 2D CNN, whatever you prefer depending on your given observation. And the planning network is a stochastic feed forward uh, neural network which takes the environment embedding with current and goal states and incrementally generates a sequence of intermediate uh, waypoints that will connect the given current and goal states. Now we use dropout in every layer to introduce stochasticity. Dropout in every forward path will probabilistically slice down the neural network so you will have variability in your output. Other approaches could some people might argue that why not give Gaussian noise as an input, but uh, from my experience, those are handcrafted distribution and whereas uh, dropout is learning randomness from data. And we will, I will show in my slide that this help us approximate sub region of a given configuration space that potentially contains a path solution. And in addition to encoder network and planning network, we have a bi-directional recursive planning algorithm. It can generate end-to-end -end paths as well as informed samples with worst case theoretical guarantees. Now let's get started with a bi-directional, recursive bi-directional planning algorithm. The reason I call it bi-directional is because the trained neural networks, encoder network and planning network are used in bi-directional manner. One neural network plans from start towards the goal, other neural network plans from goal towards the start. And these two neural networks are used by our recursive planning algorithm to decompose this problem into a sequence of sub problems in bi-directional manner. Now, some of these sub problems would have already been solved because they have direct connection between, between them, but there would also be problems with, which are still not solved. For those that are solved, we do branch and bound and throw away any unnecessary uh, states within those connected uh, edges so that we have to do minimum processing in the subsequent steps. And once we have done that, we have also identified over beacon nodes for which we still have to find the solution. So you can see like from a bigger problem, it has already decomposed the problem into a smaller problem. And for this smaller problem, it will again decompose it further. So we treat these two beacon nodes as new start and goal, and we run neural network to plan between them. We call it replanning, or you can think of it as further decomposing the sub problem into its sub problems. And it continue to do so until we have all connectable edges. And once we have that, we again, do branch and bound and throw away any unnecessary state. This can, this also leads to a good quality path solution and, uh, and help us speed up uh, the process. Now there might be some cases where let's say the planner, MPNet planner wasn't able to find a path solution for one of the sub problems. In those cases, we outsource them to a classical planner, for example, RRT star. But again, you have the planner, our planner has decomposed a bigger problem into a smaller problem and only that segment is outsourced. So I will show in my results that even with this, we are still able to retain MPNet's computational benefits while granting worst case theoretical grant, uh, uh, while granting like the worst case situation that 
if there exists a path solution, MPNet will definitely find that. So these are the visualizations. Uh, the first environment is like uh, a to clutter 2D environment and all these videos are real time. There is no speeds up. So the, the, this uh, on top left, this is a, a clutter 2D environment. I am randomly sampling start and goal pair and MPNet right away spitting out the path solution. And this is real time. We were just recording the video. And this is on rigid body and then on seven DOF robot. This timer shows the execution, but at the beginning we had this timer to show the planning time. So when this video start again, you can see that in sub seconds, less than a second, MPNet gave out the path solution and right away the robot started moving. And we had the timer on the other hand with classical planner, it took like three minutes for them to find near optimal path solution as shown in this video. They can find initial solution very quickly as I will show, but when you let them run and find a good quality path, they take a lot of time. And the, on the bottom left, this figure show that for fixed start and goal, MPNet can generate a variety of path solutions. So like we have these node and I pick two of them like as a pair start and goal and run MPNet again and again to find the path solution. And this is due to dropout uh, introduced stochasticity and you can see that due to dropout the over stochasticity is kind of informed. It is only in the region that potentially contain the path solution. And it will also become more evident as I go further to show that our method can generate informed samples that some people might not want to use our recursive planning algorithm and want to use their own algorithm. So for that, we show that MPNet can generate informed samples and you can incorporate it with any planners, sampling based planner or any other your favorite. It can generate guided samples toward the goal region. Sorry, now here question. we show, sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, quick question about uh, what are the inputs to the uh, robot in the previous video? Uh, is that images or uh... Uh, point cloud observation? Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, here uh, in the case study, I show MPNet integrated into RRT star algorithm. We randomly pick a node uh, within a tree, which is treated as a start state. And then toward the goal, you generate the next state. And MPNet does its own machine read adds it to the nearest neighbor, does its rewiring, and then again, the next step you plan again with MPNet, and you keep doing until you have this informed trees generated by uh, MPNet algorithm. And here you can see this space was like this square, and it only samples in the region that potentially contain the path solution. In fact, a variety of path solution. If you see these trees, all of these you can see could be a potential path, path solution. But because RRT star is like optimal, asymptotic optimal, it finds the shortest path and these are shown in these figures. Now let's uh, uh, talk about numbers. In these plots, uh, in these figures, the red paths are given by MPNet, blue are given by RRT star. And on the bottom, I have uh, the comp computation time in seconds. First is uh, MPNet with neural planning means that we were not outsourcing any problem to a classical planner. And the success rate was like uh, 96 to 98. I, I don't remember it is on the paper. So, but the computation time you can see is almost negligible. Then we add the classical planner for hybrid planning to outsource sub problems that were not solved by our neural planner. And even for those cases, uh, you can see it still retains its computational benefits and exhibited like 100% success rate because RRT star also gives 100% in those problems. And the, this green is MPNet SEMP where I am using MPNet with RRT star to generate informed sampling. Then we have BIT star and informed RRT star and RRT star. Now, as I move to higher like higher dimensions for planning for the Baxter. 
that initial time for uh, for BitStar and MPNet are like quite similar. But if you see the path quality, MPNet path quality is almost near optimal. And BitStar initial time was extremely, initial path length was ex almost twice the MPNet path solution. And if we run it further to decrease the path solution to the quality of MPNet solution, even for the 40%, it is like the time has increased. And if I keep running it until it find the similar solution as MPNet solution, it, it took like several minutes. So, Let's summarize here and then I have next slides like how we have extended MPNet to other problems. But so far I have discussed uh, MPNet that it can find Kulian free path as well as informed trees without unnecessary branch and bounding. And it is, you have seen it is significantly faster and can find near optimal path solution. And it does so by decomposing a given problem into a sequence of sub problems and some of them might have to get outsourced to a classical planner and that's where it gets its uh, uh, completeness guarantees and other, th other thing that i haven't talked about in these slides is about training mpnet so one way is that you have demonstration and you do simple supervised learning other approach that we discuss is active continual learning where mpnet is uh, encapsulated into a training procedure and it only asks for demonstrations when needed. So you give a planning problem. If MPNet fails to find a path solution, it will only ask the demonstration then. And because the problems are coming in stream, like in streams one by one, you have to minimize the catastrophic forgetting and all those kind of things which I have in our uh, journal paper. And this approach we show can significantly reduce the training data because uh, MPNet is only asking for the demonstration when needed and there is significant decrease in the data requirements and while exhibiting similar performance. And we have validated it on a variety of environment from seen to unseen environments from 2D to 7 degree of freedom robots. Now, where we want to go from here. So let's discuss uh, MPNet extensions. When I first proposed a lot of people like said like these are just Boolean avoidance constraints what about the harder constraints such as kinematics on robot end effector or dynamical constraint so i extended mpnet and now i will discuss uh, what are those extensions and their results so first begin with uh, kinematic constraints what are these constraints these are just the function of robot joint configurations which means they don't have velocity or acceleration in their constraint function and these constraints appear in variety of problems. For example, in robot manipulation for assistive task at home, for example, you are opening a door, that's part of kinematic constraint. You are carrying a glass filled with water and you have to keep that glass stable. That is again, a kinematic constraint. And even like your robot have to keep itself stable that comes under these kind of constraints. However, when we impose these constraints on the robot motion, they impose a low dimensional manifold inside robot configuration. So for instance, if I am opening a door, my arm is now restricted by the hinge of door, uh, which restricts my motion. And my, the man, the, my solution manifold is almost zero volume within my C space. And because sampling based algorithms sample this space randomly, the probability of generating samples on the manifold is zero, due to which all, all the methods that we discussed in the previous slide, BIT star, informed RRT star, including RRT star and RRT, they failed because they couldn't generate samples on the manifold. To augment those methods, constraint adherence approaches were proposed. One of them is projection. You randomly generate a sample and you project it towards the manifold using Jacobian gradient descent. And because uh, manifold are usually curvature in their uh, topography, so you have to transfer uh, this curved space, you cannot use Euclidean uh, base steering. So you have to do this projection to connect two points on the manifold. The other two are continuation based approaches. So one is Atlas. They 
take a non constraint adhering configuration and define a tangent space around it and using that tangent space this they are able to generate samples close to the manifold so that you need fewer projection iterations and then in the atlas it does something similar but one thing you should notice that atlas doesn't have overlapping tangent spaces it divides them nicely into half spaces whereas tangent bundle is a lazy approach and they have uh, overlapping uh, uh, tangent spaces and it doesn't do that much projections that atlas would do and in practice on high dimensional system we notice that tangent bundle can lead to invalid states which might uh, decrease the performance and these constraint adherence approaches were in, augmented with bidirectional rrt leading to c by rrt atlas rrt and tangent bundle rrt and and these frameworks have been tested in wide variety of problems and they they are like very good and they can find solution uh, like uh, they can find solution but still their computation times are extremely high and in these problems people stick with simple bidirectional rrt and they never talk about uh, uh, advanced methods such as rrt star bit star because they take significantly lot of time in high dimensional spaces in low dimensional like uh, planning on the sphere those kind of problems they can work but in high dimensional people still prefer bidirectional rrts now we extended mpnet and we introduced this one component the task encoder it takes uh, the task as a text specification for example open the cabinet and then it will lay out uh, waypoints on the manifold corresponding to this specific task and we tested it on number of problems one is this this is one example but we had a lot of scenarios randomly generated and the task here is to throw a coke can green juice bottle purple fuse bottle into the trash bin and then carefully place red mug and kettle onto the tray and you can see compnet is solving both unconstrained and constrained planning problems that it is reaching the target as well as manipulating it and this is only one neural network that is doing all of it on the right these are the like uh, box plots of total computation time for solving all the manipulation problems on this environment and you can see the variability and the total computation time of compnet is significantly lower than gold standard uh, uh, constraint uh, motion planning algorithms and this is another environment uh, which we call kitchen environment here it has to throw these uh, three objects coke can juice bottle and purple fuse bottle into the trash bin and then open the cabinet from arbitrarily like a starting a configuration and then move it fully and then place black mug and red mug out from the cabinet onto the tray without tilting and move a pitcher from the table into the cabinet again without tilting so in this problem again you can see the computation times of like atlas rrt tb rrt and c by rrt have increased significantly compared to compnet and i forgot to mention all these methods had similar success rate around 90% and these are times for just manipulation for the unconstrained problems the times were similar to uh, mpnet with similar success rate so which means that uh, computational gains on unconstrained problems are still retained one of my colleague extended uh, mpnet to dynamical constraint for non holonomic robots and we tested it on rail systems and this trained model is available as a local planner in ross navigation stack you should go and check out and this is not from our lab these are some other uh, folks that extended our work and i like them so i will mention it so Ish, Brian Ishter and his group they extended uh, this idea of end to end planning to latent spaces they map all the robot configuration to some latent space find the path there and then map them back to the c space and other work similar to what jacob did they use mpnet like approach to sample ego poses for non holonomic robot and the last two like uh, are 
from Avivtamar group. So first is sub goal trees. They, this framework takes MPNet uh, uh, recursive algorithm. It is inspired from that, like you are decomposing a problem into a sequence of sub problems and they drive a new dynamic prog uh, programming approach, which they show to be faster than traditional dynamic programming. And this is really nice pe paper with some proof you should check out. And then there's another paper from the same group, which uh, incorporates reinforcement learning to plan in narrow passage spaces using under the umbrella of neural motion planning. So that's all. And these are the papers that I have discussed so far. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Yeah, that's it. This was wonderful. Thank you. And it was a, not only like a very good overview of the method that you did, but also, I guess, uh, what other people have been doing. I've been following Aviv's work as well uh, on subcultures. trees. This is very interesting. Thank you. So, so uh, any questions? I think I have a question. Uh, yeah. Man, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned that there are certain number of cases where these things are failing. So is it failing because it, like, so what exactly are these scenarios where MPNet fails or it does not find a feasible path? So I think uh, it's because of the time limit we set for our planner. If we increase the time limit, it usually find the path solution. But in the given time limit, which is not that high, we just test if it is it was able to find it or not. And in some cases where it fails is, I think, especially the narrow passage cases where people have extended it by incorporating reinforcement learning only for those like subspaces where they explore a little bit and fine tune the neural motion planning policy. So, but if there is no such time limit, then it should still be able to, it's, it is still able to find a feasible path for, for the problem. Like I cannot guarantee that empirically it does, but if you have to guarantee you can incorporate it with SMP method and then it will definitely find a path solution if there exists a path solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, I have one perhaps slightly silly question. Um, you had a slide where you were showing us an example of the reverse end-to-end -end planning from both the directions. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, it was a, it was, right. yeah, 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 here. Um, okay. So I, I a little conf oh, oh, okay. Yeah, so, cause I was gonna ask like, if the, if it was discontinuous when it's planning from both directions, but then it should it, how does it also find the the part in the center but i see that it it, it picks the points like this i see also so, i think this is a good question and this here i should highlight another observation that when you are sampling this intermediate waypoints from the same distribution which is encoded by this neural planner solvent to like boundary value problem is easier than solving for arbitrarily selected uh, start and goal pairs. Because now these intermediate waypoints are from the distribution encoded by the planner and connecting them is easier. Hmm. I, see. I see. And so are they like the, are, are, is the, the way you pick the intermediate points, is it kind of like a random forest type thing or is it just like a heuristic? Uh, uh, no, the, it is not the random forest. These neural networks keep moving and they get the moving target. For example, when my neural network generated this node, this becomes the new goal. This, this uh, uh, neural network will move here. I and see, likewise, this, they keep moving and the problem gets shrinking and shrinking. Right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I got, I got it now. Uh, so I'm a bit unclear about uh, what supervision you're using to uh, for decomposing this problem. Uh, sorry. Right. Uh, uh, so what kind of supervision are you using to decompose the problem? 
like do you have uh, demonstrations of these intermediate waypoints that is being trained so during training uh, we assume we have demonstration data available this could be some from oracle planner like rrt star and those uh, paths are used as and their intermediate waypoints are used as demonstrations to npm okay okay good yeah So, more questions? So I'm curious uh, more sort of like, uh, not about the technical details of this paper, but about the applicability of this method on to, let's say, have you tried this out on, uh, so what sort of robots are you planning to try this out? Uh, and what are the limitations, uh, let's say, to put this on uh, uh, a bimanual robot or uh, or even, let's say, um, da Vinci. So uh, we have actually in our lab one is Da Vinci and there's another uh, Baxter. Uh, uh, there's another robot which one of my colleague is building for MRI. Ah, very like, cool. For planning in MRI spaces and they have like needle because you can the doctors yeah. have to sample things. We are extending MPNet to those, that robot so that it okay. can plan within. Uh, like along the human body and this is like MRI scanner and you have to plan inside that. It is like extremely cluttered environment and, but I think results are positive. They are not, I won't say they are in sub seconds, but they are in like couple of seconds. Still they are in couple of seconds. Other like the bimanual manipulation, I think the reason I didn't include bimanual manipulation in my constraint manifold because uh, the area was very limited. Even if you are like moving prey from one place to another, it was less than like in sub seconds. So it was not that challenging, but there you might have cases where your humanoid is moving a tray and there you have to do bimanual manipulation and balance your entire body. Like I will be really interesting, interested in seeing results there, but I haven't extended MPNet to those kind of problems. Yeah, so planning for fully humanoid, that would be interesting, so. That's very interesting. Uh, what would you say now that you are among friends are the limitations of this approach? Where would this not work? What are the open problems? As long as you have the data, it will work. So if you have a problem where data generation is hard, then this approach is limited there. Does that make sense? So if you have a data available in constraint planning, generating data was challenging because as I mentioned, uh, even the traditional planners were taking several minutes, like simple RRT, bidirectional RRT, not fancy like RRT star or batch informed RRT star. Even those simple methods were taking a lot of time. So generating data is one of the limitations. And to address that, I tried to come up with a continual learning approach where I assume data is coming in stream and MPNet will only ask for demonstration when needed. That improved the uh, data efficiency, let me show if I have a graph here. So if you see uh, this is active continual learning and batch learning. So blue is the batch learning where we assume all the training data is available. And the red is active continual learning where MPNet asks for demonstration only when needed. It improved the data efficiency, but Training with active continual learning is extremely hard because if I have slides for the approach somewhere to minimize the catastrophic forgetting, you have to have the, you have to do these dot products between your uh, current gradient on the new example and gradient on some episodic memory and you want their inner product to be positive. If they are not positive, then you have to project this new proposed gradient to some surrogate gradient so that the inner product is positive. So all these projections and solving this constraint problem along the training takes a lot of time. But the, there's other advantage that you need much 
less data if you have good computers you you can use it but still like these are the limitations that i really want to address in the future in terms of data needs Uh, so a bit more about uh, the active continual learning approach. Uh, I think there is some interest in continual learning in the group as well. Uh, so I'm curious about how you're uh, deciding when to query. So how does the agent decide when to ask? Okay. For yeah. Let me unhide these slides first. So in active continual learning, let me first compare with batch learning. We assume environment gives us some problems and oracle planner will give you all the training data and then you train right away in active continual learning environment generates one problem and your mpnet planning module will try to plan let's say within less than one second if in less than one second it fails right away you ask an oracle planner for a demonstration and using that one single demonstration you have to train mpnet in a way so that it doesn't forget the previous learning and by actively asking the oracle planner we are kind of minimizing the demonstration that had to be generated by the underlying planner. so does that answer your question yeah 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 that does thanks um, I have another perhaps silly question. Um, so when you're trying to make the problem smaller, um, the what happens if you're in a situation where doing that typically can make the problem more difficult? So let's say I just printed this out super quickly. Let's say you're you're in like a maze of yes. this type, and um, and that's in between you and your goal. So then if you were to approximate by just going closer, you might go in a worse part of the maze, some type of situation. Does this could happen, yeah, throw it yeah because or? this is, yes, yes. This could happen, one thing, because it's a stochastic planning method, right. okay. you can have uh, like anomalies, but through replanning and repair, I think you can come out of those situations. Other thing, like even if it is a maze, if you give some decent demonstrations, I think it will generate good quality paths. But uh, other thing that I wanted to mention that uh, in those maze environments, another thing that I'm working on these days, like how to minimize this replanning, how to make the global planning so good that we don't have to do the replanning. Because if you think of constraint planning problem, we notice that even one connecting two nodes is extremely expensive because you have to do all the projections of intermediate sub points. It takes a lot of time. So I, I want to minimize this replanning. Not that I am against it, like, but in advanced problems, this is uh, computationally expensive. I see, I see. So Thank we you. want this planner to plan in a single go. And other thing that, which I think would be interesting to think of like lazy search approach but from Sid Sirinavasov like group. If you think of these approaches and you mentioned this maze uh, environment, I think maybe, I'm not sure how, but maybe we can use similar approaches to discourage those edges that will take you away from your goal solution. I see, thank you, yeah, super interesting answer. Yeah, really making me scratch my brain. Um, I have a, maybe a silly question as well, um, but um, is there examples of, or have you tried um, using this approach for kind of more manipulation style tasks or more contact rich um, tasks, like for example, in hand manipulation, that kind of thing? No, we haven't. Uh, even in the, the manipulation examples that I show, we are not taking care of contact dynamics. Right. Okay. So in my paper, we have rare reports, so we had to like adjust grid per location because it was squeezing objects and things like that. But Baxter is not a good robot for manipulation either, so yeah. it makes things even harder. <laughs> A 
which simulator is this? Is this Mujo? So I built like this is in within Open Rave. I think it would take me like around one month, and I will release all the data set and trend models. They 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 will be oh. available on. Okay, cool. I have a, a small question. Uh, so how far uh, your model can plan ahead? So what is the, the uh, optimal horizon for planning? Hmm. So I don't have uh, any theoretical bounds for that, but I think I, I would recommend re reading this paper, like sub goal trees where they decompose the problem into half and then the half of that problem. For example, in K0, you had the start and goal. It was decomposed into half and mm -hmm. then it was further decomposed and they have those kind of bounds which you like, you, you can use uh, to like come up with reasoning like how much decomposition I would have to do and how much nodes i will have to gen generate in terms of long-term planning like long horizon problems if you see this kitchen environment like i have a lot of videos on my website but some were like really convoluted and this is simple uh, like uh, mp net planning for them there was no classical approaches so even for long horizon problems i can say if the model is trained properly it can generate Pass, but I don't have any bounds on it. I see. Thank you. Was there a particular reason you used Open Rave, not let's say Pagulet or something? So because I was uh, when I was trying to understand these uh, constraint planning problems, C by RRT was the only available one, and it is in Open Rave. Got it. <laughs> Would is there any any plan to perhaps sort of interface it with something like PyBullet or or OMPL or move it or something like that? So I have another paper coming up. We are integrate. We have already integrated into OMPL, okay. and you can use this with any OMPL planner. Got it. Okay. And but still, we we integrated uh, o, OMPL with OpenRave for demonstration, but we show on their environments that it can you can easily integrate uh, no so uh, yeah it, we have OMPL now it should be available like in a couple of months okay cool any more questions uh, a question about the, the training simple one. So how much data does it need like expert demonstration to get a reasonably like generalizable neural network that you use in your planning? I think there is a trade off like the training data and the amount of generalization that you would expect. If you are testing in similar domains of your training data then i think you would need uh, you can make it work with smaller number of demonstrations but if you wanted to generalize across a variety of environments for example in uh, simple 2d cases we tested it on more than uh, 100 environments and within each environment we had randomly selected 2000 start and goal pairs i think if i'm not forgetting this so like on such a vast data set, if you want to test its generalization, you need large amount of data. But here, like for example, in manipulation, we had like, I think, uh, I don't remember how many environments we had. I think they were like 2000 or something. But then our models were accordingly smaller and you would not, you should not expect like generalization across different domains it will be within uh, same environment settings, but it can generalize to different objects, locations. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. 
So what I'll let you guys do is, is perhaps sort of continue the discussion and maybe have one-on-one -on -one meetings. I would like to thank Ahmed again. Thank uh, you, Anime, for, for having